This is the Art Beauty Podcast, where we are always reaching for truth in beauty. The people on the show are not paying to be here, which means that we get to ask the questions we know what you want answers to because you deserve to be informed so you can make the best decisions for yourself. I'm Amber, and today my fabulous co-host is Dr. Babek Azizadeh. He is a board-certified facial plastic surgeon and a pioneer of the deep plane facelift. If you have not heard of this, get ready for an incredible ride. Before we get into anything, welcome to the show, Dr. Azizadeh. Thank you, Amber. I really appreciate it. And I'm really excited to be a part of this. I mean, you're going to hear how excited I am because this is something that I have been like obsessed with seeing on <laughs> social media. Um, but to be honest, I don't even really know what it is. I just know I want one. That's it. I've seen the befores. I've seen the afters. Um, so, you know, what, can you just like, let's start off. What is a deep plane facelift? How does it differ from a regular facelift? So to get into what a deep plane facelift is, I think we got to really understand the anatomy and okay. uh, what happens with the aging process, because that's really at the core of it. Uh, aging process, of course, traditionally, we always think about sagging skin, and that is a big part of the aging process. But we also lose a lot of volume, our bones resorb, the fat pockets change its positions. And all these ligamental structures of the face loosen up. Right. So what the traditional facelifts were, was you go in, you lift the skin, maybe tighten up a little bit of the deeper layers that were structural support for the face. And they worked really well. Not to say anything negatively about it. They worked very, very well. But a few people started thinking like, look, the results are good, but they're not great. And they're not long lasting. And that's really the critical thing. So the deep plane facelift doesn't lift the skin. It basically goes to the deeper structural ligamentous structures of the face and supports them and repositions them so that, and then the skin just comes along with it. So as a result, it doesn't look like a windswept look. It doesn't look like you've had, and if it's done correctly, you should be feel so authentic, natural, that no one should be able to tell if they've never met you, or even if maybe an acquaintance hasn't seen you in a few years, be able to tell you've had anything done. But you look right. fabulous, you look great, and it lasts a long time. So, I mean, I did a deep dive on your before and afters with this, um, but you're telling me, so there's no skin, like there's no pulling of the skin at all with the deep plane facelift? Yeah. So the deep plane, uh, the skin is, is a byproduct of the surgery. Like okay. we, we, do, we do remove skin because. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cause I was like, where, where did it go? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, we do remove, but it's a, as a, as a byproduct of the surgery. So the surgery, you know, you go right under the skin, then you go into the deep layers and muscles and we call them the SMAS and the platysma muscle. Those are very critical structures. We go deep to those, separate them out and reposition them. And then there'll be a little bit of skin here, a little bit of skin there, a little nip and tuck, but that's really a byproduct. We're not pulling on skin. In fact, when we close the incisions, the skin is just kind of like trimmed out. Like, you, you know, you would go to a, a, a tailor. It's not really pulled. And that's why the results are really phenomenal. But with the old school facelifts, um, that was really more of a, just a pulling of the skin. Yeah. Pulling of the skin was the, because everyone thought sagging skin was the problem, but now we know it's the kind of the loose, deeper tissue layers as well as volume loss. And that's where the deep plane facelift. And of course, we always want to think about some ancillary pro, uh, uh, procedures like fat grafting, other right. things with the lip, with the eyes to create a harmonious structure because not everything is, it's a three-dimensional process. And everyone, the other thing is that it's not a deep plane facelift with different surgeons and different patients has to be different. It's customized, right? right? Sure. It's gotta be personalized. And that's one of the things, that's where the art, like your art podcast, art of beauty comes <laughs> in. And that's the artistic vision, I think of the doctor. Right. That, you know, uh, in in conjunction with discussions with patients, that's critical. 
you know, we have surgical skills that are super important. Obviously, you want a great surgeon, you want a safe surgeon, you want a surgeon who understands the anatomy and so forth. But what you want is a surgeon that has all of that, plus the artistic skills. Sure. Because the artist, it's, it's truly an artwork, right? Every individual, every patient is a work of art at the end of the day. Now, where are you located? Beverly Hills. Okay. And so, you know, I'm glad that you bring this because, well, I'm in New York and I feel like when, you know, when you look at the plastic surgery, um, I, I, I guess the aesthetics that people are going after, they're very different from the East coast to the West coast. Absolutely. I trained, it's interesting. My training was, first of all, I thought I had no artistic ability going into med school. I, I never did artwork. I kind of moved to the U S when I was 10 years old. I had no idea I wanted to be a plastic surgeon. I thought I was going to be a cardiac surgeon. Okay. Um, so yeah, so the, the plastic surgery part was a very, very interesting turn. But yeah, I trained uh, in the West Coast and in the East Coast. I trained in Boston. Okay. And uh, that's where I did my fellowship. And it was interesting. I had so many patients who would come and say, oh my God, my family's out of town for 10 days. I want to get my facelift. And I was like, okay, you're kidding, right? So I understand that different regions have different biases and different surgeons have different biases. And sure. that's why when you're looking at finding a surgeon, it's not just their abilities, but it's their artistic sense. It's their aesthetic goals. Right. And that. I think has actually, it's not an East Coast, West Coast thing. It's a surgeon related process because I have a lot of great surgeon friends. We're like all BFFs, but we do things differently. And sure. certain, yeah, certain patients love their results and certain patients love my results because right. they have different artistic sense as well. Okay. You know, it's funny when I had, um, when I went in for um, breast augmentation, uh, I went in for a lift and I remember my doctor said, you know, if you are looking for that giant sort of look, like I'm not your doctor. If you want something that looks very natural, very subtle, like this is where I excel. Um, but you know, when it comes to the face, you know, it's so interesting because I guess you want to look like you, but the better you. Yeah. Um, you know, so when you're looking at before and afters, you know, because you went into like finding a great surgeon, what's the best way in your opinion to make sure that this is the right surgeon for you, knowing that everybody's face is different? So there are two critical aspects of results. I look at, I call them authentic okay. and effortless. It's got to be effortless. You can't, you know, if someone's walking down the street and you're like, oh my God, who is the plastic surgeon that did that? you know, plastic surgery, that that's, you know, probably not a great result actually, right? You So you want it to be authentic and effortless. The way I would look at it is look at the afters first, right? Okay. Does that individual look like they've had plastic surgery? Do they look good? You don't have to criticize all the little things. Oh, I don't like this or that. You just have, does that individual look great? Do they look beautiful? You want right. people to look beautiful, authentic, natural. You look at the afters and then look at the befores. And all of a sudden you're like, whoa, that may be a big transformation or it may be a subtle transformation, but that after is really what you're after. Right. Because um, if the afters look effortless, authentic, natural, the patient looks great. They look beautiful um, at any age, right? That's That's what we want. And we want individuals to look appropriate and kind of what my own what I would say my gift is like I could talk to you for two minutes I could see you I know what you're gonna want because like looking at you I'll be honest you look beautiful you look gorgeous effortless appropriate you know you're not gonna want some radical transformation right even if it means like you're gonna have like a more like little bit of a more uh, detail aesthetic goals. There are other individuals that do want that. And that's cool too. There's no, everyone wants something different. Hey, right. But, but I know, yeah, I so that's why, you know, we're here and there's, you know, everyone, you, you know, some people like, you know, Picasso, some people like Monet, some people like modern art and it's cool. All of it is beautiful. So that's really the key authenticity of the results 
and really effortless, beautiful, okay. attractive. You know, listen, and I know some people wear their plastic surgery and want it to be noticeable as a badge of honor. And, you know, that's why I love doing the show. I feel like as long as you are doing this for the right reasons, and those right reasons are really depending on what you want. I'm such a huge supporter um, and have seen how it can make such a huge huge difference. You know, you mentioned me um, and and I'm going to take this back a little bit because one of the things I'm now 40, 43. And for me, I always looked at like the facelift is something that you're doing in your 60s, 70s. I'm finding now that a lot of people are doing this much younger. Um, what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, it's a great question. And I think there's no great answer for it. But for the right. most part, what I look at is number one, the, every individual ages differently. Every individual has different genetic predispositions, different environmental issues. Some people, I mean, I have some before and after this patient's like, oh my God, that person is 80. I'm like, no, 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 that person's like 53, right. you know? And um, so everyone is different and in a different, and everyone wants something different. I'll give you a perfect example. So a lot of my patients, I mean, I don't have like, over the top actresses, but I have a lot of A-list actresses. They just want to keep looking great and they'd rather have surgery a little bit earlier so they don't look like you. They've had a transformation, but they can elongate their time where they look beautiful and attractive and they keep looking great. So wait, those wait, I want to ask you really there. quickly. Are, are there any that you're allowed to say who are patients of yours? No, no. I mean, the people Dang. That, yeah. The people <laughs> Listen, that, some actresses you know, are like, time. yeah, absolutely. This is my doctor, and this is who keeps me looking great. I love that when when yeah, when people not do many that. people do that, and the people who do are very over the top. That's the that's 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 generally the sense. It's not. It's still there's there's a you know there's still a little stigma associated with it in the entertainment in Hollywood about plastic surgery, even though everybody has it, everyone gets it, everyone does it. Um, so that individual or someone who is like really, uh, uh, the business world is a big part of their life or they want to look like a beautiful mom, not a beautiful grandmother. So right. they're gonna have things that are a little bit, they're gonna start a little bit earlier. How early really depends. We know there are two big transition points that have been proven scientifically in the aging process. It's age 49 and age 59. Those are very two, what I call cliffs, right. <laughs> that there are significant transformation in our genetic, in our collagen, in our elasticity, in our aging process. Right. So those are time periods where I would say a lot of people, if they can kind of do their thing before those times, it's better than after. Okay. But you know what? So I'm, there is a doctor in New York who's very well known for doing this deep plane facelift. Um, and I've seen patients like in their late thirties mm -hmm. who are going in. And I just wonder, you know, is that, is there any benefit to doing it younger or is it something, you know, that, well, if you do it younger, you're not going to really be able to do it older again, because there's going to be scar tissues. Like, are there any of those considerations? So facelift, on like, uh, let's uh, kind of separate this out. Like if you're getting your eyes done, right? Eyes, you really have two cracks at it. Right. Because the scar tissue, the way the muscles heal, the way the eyes heal, you can't keep going back for more. With the face, you have a little bit more. If, if you have a talented doctor who understands the anatomy, who understands the facial nerve and all that stuff, you can have a couple of surgeries very, very, very safely. So if someone decides in their mid 40s soft surgery, that's okay because probably the next time they'll have surgery, maybe it'll be in their 60s, right? right? So, and then after that, you know, the chances someone in their 80s will want to have surgery is going to be a little bit less. So again, I, I don't look at anyone's age. I honestly, like when someone walks in, I don't look at their age. That's okay. the last thing. Of course, I want their health status because health sure. is very important. And I want to know their goals. And that's how I'll create, whether it's a surgical plan or a non-surgical plan is determined by really what their goals are and what their concerns are. And making sure that 
what their issues are are things that are actually valid and real and that I can help with. So I barely look at people's ages, but on average, my patient population is probably between 45 and 65. I would say those are, that's kind of the, now there's once in a while, like there was a lady, I just, like I didn't do a, a deep plane facelift, but I did a very deep neck contouring because she had, she was born with a small chin, very heavy neck. And, you know, it doesn't matter if she's 25, 35. It doesn't matter, five, right. That doesn't matter. No, I'm talking specifically about these deep plane yeah. facelifts. Yeah, I would um, say- 45 yeah. to 65 to 70, you know, yesterday I did on a 75 year old. I mean, you know, yeah. if they're healthy, you know, we don't, again, today people are going to live, the average age is going to be over 90, you know, for, so we're long age issues are really, I think, minimized. It's your health issues that matter. Sure. Your concerns. You know, speaking of realistic goals and expectations, um, you know, before you mentioned when you were working in Boston that somebody came in and said, oh, my family's gone for 10 days, let's do a facelift. And you were like, whoa. So what is that recovery process like? What is the surgery like? Like, what is that realistically like in terms of downtime? You want the long answer or the short answer? I, I, let's go, you can give me the long answer. So there are four phases of peeling. Okay, the first phase is like the first couple of days you're really kind of feeling like you've had a bad case of flu. Then after that, you feel pretty good, but you look bruised and swollen. Usually at 10 days, and I would say, I'm going to talk about 95% of individuals, sure. not 100%. There's always exceptions. At 10 days, most people are out and about running their errands, okay? Doing their things, whatever it is. At two to three weeks, most people are out. They can go to a cocktail party. They can go to an event. They can three weeks, four weeks. You could go to a black tie function event. Now, if it's like your own wedding, I would not recommend that. But you know, if it's something that probably is like one level below that. But when you're Final talking about human, six oh, sorry, six Final months. When you're human, talking about months. people in Hollywood and these A listers, I mean, that's six months is a long so, time to be no, out. Four weeks. I tell most of my patients four weeks. They can go audition, do this, do that, and so forth. Four weeks, 99% okay. of people look really, really great. They have some residual stuff, you know, incisional healing and so forth. That's very easily, uh, because all the incisions are also in areas that are like almost cosmetically insignificant. They heal so well. So, uh, so the patients can get back pretty quickly. So many questions. Okay. Those first couple of days, like, are you in full head bandage? No, no, I don't use bandages. I don't. Most, most surgeons do. I stopped doing that 10 years ago. Life changed for me and for patients because it's so claustrophobic, so uncomfortable, and it made no difference in the outcome. And so I stopped doing that about 10 years ago. And really it kind of makes all the differences in the world. Okay. So where are your um where are the incisions that are happening and, and and what does that kind of look like? Yeah. So the incisions for the most part are all at the edges of where your hairline and skin is. Okay. So that way, yeah. So no, not up here. I don't like here. incisions there. It's really yeah, right there. And then there's a small incision right inside your ear cartilage. Okay. Not in and front of the ear. I've seen else. like the No, not in front. Although the front like feels well. If it's done correctly, if it's not done correctly, it heals really poorly. Um, and then everything else is behind it here. So very, very well hidden. If it's executed well, in 99.9% .9 of patients, it becomes cosmetically insignificant within a few weeks. Within a few weeks. Okay. Listen, yeah. we just got to keep it real here. You know, again, going back to the surgery that I had, I could not for the first three days, I had no idea. I had a lift and um, a small implant put in just to retain this original shape, original oh, yeah. size. Um, they were like, yeah, you should be fine. You know, a couple of days of downtime. I could not sit up. I was sleeping on a wedge. I had no idea, you know, that you don't think about your abdominals being affected, but like my husband had to literally help me up. So I love it when doctors sometimes are like, ah, da, 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 da. and then meanwhile, when you're the patient, and of course, you know, as a doctor, you're doing this, 
you're seeing hundreds of patients go through this um, so that you know that overall the recovery is not yeah. a big deal when you're going through it. It's a big deal. So like, are there it's problems? It's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Like eating, sleeping. I never sleeping. tell people it's not a big deal. <laughs> I never tell anyone it's not a big deal. It is a big deal, but it's something that, again, facial surgery is a little bit different than body surgery. Yeah. Because when your pectoralis muscle or your abdominal muscles are impacted, which happens with breast surgery and or tummy tucks and other liposuction and so forth, the recovery is very different. Right. Again, at the, you know, a, a certain time, everyone kind of converges. In right. facial surgery, I would say, what's the most uncomfortable thing in my patients? I'll tell you exactly. Because I do a lot of neck work because yeah. that's like really, so I tighten up the muscles. I tight, I mean, you feel kind of tight in the neck, even without, you know, without the bandages that I would say, if I were to say, what's the most uncomfortable thing, that is the most uncomfortable thing in the first few days. And that's like, kind of like tight, like you've been pulled or tight, like you can't breathe. No, not breathing. It's just because we like try to, this is where a lot of surgery fails. We do a beautiful facelift, neck lift, and the neck looks kind of really bad. So that's like one of the really critical areas in a deep plane facelift. And the modern, more modern deep plane facelift where we're utilizing the deep muscles here and so forth, that's really critical to get that correct. And that tends to be actually very permanent when it's done right, because a lot okay. of it is related to the deep fat pockets and other things in the neck. And if you can do that well, it's a really, really wonderful thing because for the rest of your face, you can use a little bit of fillers, a little bit of fat and so forth to keep it really looking youthful. The neck, you can't, there's no technique, non-surgical technique that we can keep your neck looking youthful. I just met a woman at an event who had had a neck lift like a week before. I'd never met her before. So she just shared this with me, which I love, love, love her for it. Um, but when I saw her before and after, I was like, oh my God. But with the neck, you couldn't tell. She was like, yep, last week. You know, there was like no incisions and she looked great. Um, sorry, I'm digressing here. So, okay. So this is a major surgery. We also know surgeon dependent, um, where you live, what you're having done, all of this is going to impact the cost, but can you give us a ballpark range? Oh boy. Yeah. So this is the most difficult answer and I'm going to kind of try to put it in. You can spend anywhere between $10,000 to $250,000 for this surgery. Yeah. It doesn't mean that, you know, what I would say is the following. There are great surgeons and there are not so great surgeons. Typically, I would say the surgeons who have the most experience, expertise, and this is a blanket, tend to be busier and tend right. to charge a higher fee. It doesn't mean that they're... Bad, bad people for charging higher fees. It's just, look, they're busy supply and they and have demand. supply and demand. And some of my really, really, really great surgeon friends, they, they charge a lot and they're really good and they should charge that much. So, so um, now I'm going to get into one more thing after that. Are there doctors that are doing this for $25,000 that are really good? Yeah, there are, there are good doctors, but it's got you to find them. It's going to be a little bit more difficult. And where is that? You know, where is that like range? I know again, going back to my surgery, very yeah, different I ones. Say, I went to the best. I was like, who is the best? Because look, daddy always told me don't save on two things, birth control and plastic surgery, right? Because this is changing your body and this is forever. And I really want to reiterate to everybody at home who's listening, plastic surgery injectables, anything that you're doing, this is not the time to get a Groupon. It is just not. Thank you. Thank it's you. not. It's not. Um, I will tell you, the doctor in New York that I was looking at, I feel like it starts at 70. 70 just for the consultation and yeah. up. Yeah, I would say up, it's 50 and above for most really great plastic surgeons. 
but you're gonna probably pay over a hundred thousand dollars for the best ones and that's I mean I mean I don't I know it's like it sounds and, and I know like as a consumer it's science by the way I agree with you a hundred percent I'll tell you my own personal story and one of the reasons I did end up going into plastic surgery I had a badly broken nose when I was a kid my nose was super crooked Everyone would make fun of me. I wasn't super insecure about it. I went to a doctor when I was, you know, like a teenager and the doctor was the best in LA and he was really out of my budget. Right. Okay. My family couldn't afford it. I didn't do the surgery. Thank God. One of my really good friends did do a surgery with someone who was really not that was, you know, cheaper. And they had the they had to go and get a revision surgery and another yeah. revision. And before they were done, they had spent like literally a hundred thousand dollars between all this stuff, plus kind of like revisional and all that stuff. I ended up waiting. I ended up going to to the same doctor when financially I could afford it. And exactly, my parents were like, "Don't do surgery until we can afford this doctor because this is the right doctor for you." So I do believe yeah. in that because you know when. When people, and I'm not saying, again, there are really, really great doctors at a variety of different levels, but it's just harder to find at kind of the, you know, younger, earlier phase. And this is a project I am actually working on, by the way, and we'll do another podcast when I'm ready to discuss this matter, because I do think this is something that's very important for us to be able to kind of create a little bit more transparency in terms of the doctors, their quality beyond Yelp and third-party platforms that are kind of, like you said, you said something very important. No one gets paid to be on your podcast, right? Yeah. And No, no one's paying me to be on the podcast, which means that it's not this like, oh my God, you're the best. Yeah. It's like, and hey, it's let's- it's promotion And yeah. that's what it is. You know, when we're on Instagram, my Instagram, I'm self-promoting myself, right? Sure. When- you have a website, you're self-promoting. When you're on real self, you're self-promoting. When you're on some of the other third-party platforms, it's all self-promotion. The, you know, there's no objectivity to who's good, who's not. There's no peer review objectivity. Right. So I'm working on a project that I think will be really, really great and will hopefully actually create a much better um, price transparency, but more important, price, you know, everyone has a different budget. You know, totally. somebody has a budget unlimited, great. You know, and some people have a budget of, listen, 25, 50K, 60K. And I think you could find a doctor in that budget too, but it's harder. I mean, I, you know, I don't care who you are, even if you're rich, 50K is not a drop in the bucket. It's just not. No, I know for some people lot. it's way more expendable. So I will tell you a funny story and maybe you guys can do this. I recently met with my accountant tax time doing all of that. And he was like, oh, I see you've got these buckets of savings. You have one called the PS fund. Is that like your, oh, you know, emergency, like PS, like, oh, um, we're going to go to like, you know, Europe. And I was like, no. That's my plastic surgery fund because I'm saving because one day I'm going to need that. And every month I just drop a little bit in there. And I started when I was like 30 because I knew how expensive these procedures are. And again, I want to make, I mean, I know, well, but listen, Hey, save up to go to the good doctors. I will tell again, going back to my experience, um, my result was fabulous, was wonderful. When I met with other women who also had fabulous results, where they were most impressed was that I had minimal scarring, right? So that is, again, all to credit of the surgeon, the surgeon's talents, but they were like, wow, you paid almost double what I did. And then when we kind of lifted up our shirts and looked, they were like, wow, oh my God, you've got no scar. So listen, it, it's- You nailed it. You nailed you get, it. Yeah. You know, I hate to say, it, you, you, you know, but I feel like within surgery, you get what you pay for. Certainly um, there are, you know, it's going to be a lot more expensive in LA, New York than it might be in the Midwest. And there are fabulous surgeons there, but, you know, just be wary if you're getting something cheaper, because like you said, in the end, the revisions and the damage, and, you know, when you're talking about your face and nerves and, and musculature, yeah, some safety. of that probably is yeah. ir- irreversible, right? I mean- yeah. Listen, the safety factors are not discussed enough. And, you know, right. everyone's talking about, but the sa- this is, it is all artwork and science and surgery, but there is a safety, like, again, you could buy two art pieces. Let's compare it. Maybe one is like multi-million dollars, another one. Okay. If you buy something inexpensive, it's, 
it's not going to hurt you, but with facelifts, with rhinoplasty, with body work, like you had, if you get nerve damage, you get bad scarring, you get, I mean, all of that stuff is not only going to cost you so much more to fix, but it's almost, I hate the word mutilating, but it's almost mutilating. So, so it is, it is, a, it is a very critical. Now, having said that every surgeon, and this is, I do want to talk about this because this is obviously every great surgeon, every good surgeon, every surgeon will have their share of what we call complications. Yeah. Great surgeons will have a lower rate of complications than the surgeons who are not safe, who are not great. And surgeons who have a lot of volume, they're doing three, 400, 500 facelifts a year. If you just count 1%, which is very low, the national average of complications is probably 5%. 7% in rhinoplasty, it's probably 20%. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So the national average, I'm not like board certified. Right. So start at a board certified surgeon who has credential really good. There are certain surgeries that have very high rate of unsatisfactory outcome, patients who are not happy and so forth. Now, someone who's doing 500 facelifts a year, great surgeon, really, really good. Let's say 1% of his patients are not happy, or maybe he did something wrong. Maybe their expectations were different than what it should have been. Maybe there was something that happened. That's five people. That's, yeah. you know, so when you hear about one off or two off or even five off comments and stuff like that, that's why it's a very difficult area to actually be the surgeon. And that's why surgeons who are very busy do want to command higher fees because they have to deal with a lot more discerning patients and they have to get paid uh, appropriately for that, you know, sure. and yeah. supply and demand. So that's that's the one thing I would say for, for people who are listening, it is very, very difficult. And that data is not out there, right? You could go to Yelp, you could go to a lot of different sites. People can like, but that data isn't there. Someone who's doing a lot of surgeries is going to, by na nature, have a higher rate of, you know, a, a, a higher number, not rates. Total a number. number. Uh, right. Yeah. So question, is there any law, you know, on that point where if I go to a surgeon and say, how many of these have you done and how many um, have not? been you know up to par or how many complications have you had? is there any law that medically you have to provide that information i don't think there's a law that you have to provide it but most surgeons do i mean you know i usually that's part of my discussion with patients right. because i think it's important i go over because i do also a lot of outcomes research on my own patients because i want to see what i'm doing if that's working it's not working a lot of that comes to quality of life. A lot of that comes to patient satisfaction. So I will go through and say, look, I do this surgery maybe twice a week. I do it on a very routine basis. My five-year satisfaction rate with my patients is 97%, 98%, 95%, whatever it may be right. for that particular surgery. And based on your, what I see that, you know, if someone comes in and is very, for instance, you know, their, their expectation is very high. I will usually reject them. And yeah. it, it's a bad word to use, but it's like, I will say, listen, I don't think I'm the right surgeon for you. I don't think I can meet your expectations. So I am also very discerning, just like patients are making sure it's a patient, it's an individual that I can make happy. I never want to do any surgeries that I don't think I have a very high chance of getting that patient to be happy. If so, that's, Another part of, there are some surgeons that they will like operate on anyone, right? Yeah. And there are some surgeons that don't. So it's very critical. Again, it's a, it's a very complex process and a complex uh, uh, interaction. Uh, but overall, if you find a great surgeon, good, uh, you know, credentials, good word of mouth from people that, you know, you have seen, et cetera, um, understand the anatomy, understand complications, understand. And sometimes it's not just 
understanding complication, but managing complications. Yeah. You want a surgeon who's talented and understands and doesn't blow things off that treats you just as well after surgery as before surgery. So those are all the complexity that goes into this relationship that you're yeah. going to get into with your surgeon. And you've experienced that and you kind of, you know, understand that well. Well, and you know what, to, you, you really bring up a good point. One of the things, if you are considering this, make sure that you understand how easy it is to contact them for aftercare, because I can guarantee you this, no matter what, this is going to be the most traumatic thing probably that you've been through, right? Or are or, or up there because you will have just gone through something that is very traumatic emotionally. I, I tell everybody, you know, any kind of surgery, whether it's um, cosmetic, whether it's um, something that's medical, you're, there's an emotional component to it where you're going to be not feeling yourself. You're going to be sad. Yeah. You're on medication. You're you're not as um, well. Same thing when you get the flu. Bi buyer's right? you're, you're emotional. Yeah. And, buyer's and, remorse oh, in the first week. A thousand percent. Yeah. I, why did I do this to myself? This was the dumbest thing I ever yeah. did. Um, you know, and then you get through that. But it's really important to make sure that your plastic surgeon or their office will be understandable, will be accessible. Um, that's Absolutely. a really huge component. You know, one other thing I wanted to bring up is, you know, you mentioned before, like when we're looking for surgeons, you know, looking at before and afters can be tricky, right? And I, I've only learned this now from just looking at tons. Is there a point where you should ask your surgeon, can I see results after X amount of time? Right. Because yeah, I've seen people who have had, reasonable. Yeah, you know, like, uh, I think that's reasonable. Um, part of, you know, what's happened with social media, you know, when we go and publish papers in peer reviewed journals, they want a minimum of a one year follow up, right? right? That's the, the, pretty much they will ask you if this is a short term follow up, it's not going to get published, right? Social media, you know, like people are uh, hour later, it's kind of cool, actually, to see look an hour later, what happens? That's like, actually nice. But very few people now publish or present long-term results. Right. And I think it is very important. One year to two years, I think is a very nice point where you see what's going on. And what I do in my practice, when I go, I go through actually before and afters during my consultations, I think it's very important because I have to explain what that patient wanted, what I wanted to do, and this is what we got. And I try to show patients that have at one month, at three months, at nine months, at one right. year. And it's gonna... I have results that are 10 years old, 15 years old, because I, I, you know, I stay in touch with my patients for a long, long time. And thank God they, you know, they, they keep coming back for, you know, to see me. So that's very, very important. I agree with you a hundred percent. And, you know, I want to be conscious of your time here because like I told you that we could talk about this forever. You know, before I let you go, there's I could talk about this forever. I mean, I love I, it. I'm so I, passionate I, about it. I'm telling you, I was like, I don't even really know what this is, but I know I want one. I know I want one one day. I'm prepared. I've been saving for it. Um, you know, not ready today. Um, but I do know that, you I know, this you're is in good shape. Yeah. You, <laughs> I mean, yeah we're, we're in good yeah, shape. You don't need, you don't need anything right now. So, um, you know, but uh, uh, on that before, I, 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 without trying to digress too much, but I do a lot of Althera, right? So you're talking about the SMAS and these oh. deeper things. So things to try to help stave off and build that collagen. Are there other procedures that you like to kind of maybe, or you, you made a face, you, you don't love Althera? Yeah, no, I, I had Althera and I liked it. I'll tell you the one downside about energy-based devices. I think they're very good. And especially I think for your age base, very good keeps things tight, kind of keeps keeps the tissues. But just like everything else, too much of it may not be necessarily good. Because one mm. of the things that we were now, I'm about to actually publish on this, is that we've seen individuals who've had a lot of energy-based devices, Althera, other profound, et cetera, et cetera. There's a ton of them, face tight. They all have some pros and cons, and they're all very good for a variety of different things. When we go into surgery, it's a much harder surgery. It's like kind of like revision surgery because what have they done? They basically created scar tissue, right? To accomplish what they want. So those individuals who've had a lot of these energy-based devices 
we actually like treat, I treat them like revision surgery, nerve monitors, like making sure everything's like really like, you know, we're, we're taking care of, you know, it's, it's almost like a completely different uh, process. So yeah. Very you're... interestingly enough, I did uh, at a 75 year old patient, as you can imagine, she had had nothing. The tissues were so like, so beautiful and buttery and soft and it was such an easy surgery because she had not had fillers. She had not had Althera. She had not had anything. But in our younger patients who are more likely to get these surgeries, they have had all this and the surgeries are actually a little bit harder. Shoot. Are you telling me stop Althera? No, I don't think you need to stop it. But there are people that go in every two months to get Althera. I don't recommend that. I, I think you know, that. Do something <laughs> once a year, once every couple of years, that's fine. That's what yeah. I'm doing. I'm, I'm, on, the, I'm on the, I mean, I, I love how I say that I do all there. I think I've done it twice, um, yeah, but that's kind of my yeah. like, okay. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, people with threading, I've heard that threading oh, okay. really per, per, like presents a problem if you no, want to no. get- No, it's a no, no. Yeah, it's surgery a, later it's on. My, right? like, I'm not a very absolutist in anything, but threading- Absolutely no, no. I don't like it. I've seen so many complications with it. I don't think it's actually effective. It doesn't really do that much. That uh, and it's invasive. It's you're putting these barbed wires. Okay, imagine you know barbed wires that are used to keep people out of your you know like compounds. You're you're putting that in your neck in your face, and like not to scare people, but the other day I actually went in, someone thought they had some nerve thing. I went in to look and there was a barbed wire, like a, going through their nerve. In their nerve. So oh, I, no. I would just like, that's a no, no. I, to yeah. me that that's a no, no. Um, again, if someone really believes in it, I'm okay with it. But generally I don't recommend that to anyone. Yeah. I, I, listen, I, you, keeping real here, I've seen people who've had it, who have great results. Um, there've been a few doctors because I've got that heaviness in here who are like, oh, you'd be a really good candidate for it. But I know I'm like that to me, I'm a side sleeper. I've seen too many things go wrong. Also, it just sounds horrific. No, yet, uh -uh, pass. Um, okay. So we've gone over costs. We've gone over recovery time. You know, before I let you go, is there anybody who you think really is not a candidate for a deep plane facelift? No, honestly, deep plane facelift, just like anything else, is a technique. Right. And um, if they're a candidate for a facelift, generally that is the technique that gives the patients the best results. Okay. Now, if someone like, for instance, sometimes we go in for revisions or triple revisions or someone and they have no real layer, the deeper layer, we can't do it on them. You know, we have to modify and we have to do different things. So for the most part, I would say 99% of people who are candidates for a facelift, the deep plane approach is the best approach right. for them. So um, you have one more question. Oh, I, I do, I do, I do, I do. How long in general is the actual surgery? Um, probably about four hours. Uh, so um, again, some people do it in two to three, some people do it in six to seven, but on average, I would say four hours for just, again, the neck and the cheeks and the face and all of that, not including if you need, some people need eyelid surgery. Some people we do lip lifts, some people we do brow lifts, all of that. The deep plane facelift is really focused on the mid face, lower face and neck, not on the brow, not on the eyes, not on the lips. Dr. Azizadeh, I could talk to you about this, like I said, forever. I want to I'm thank you so always much. Always available. Be happy for giving to us back. your very, very valued time. Um, if people are in your area or if they want to come and see you, um, what's the best way to find you? Probably if they go on my Instagram, that's going to be the easiest. Dr. Azizadeh, Dr. Azizadeh. So they can find me and obviously call, email, a multitude of ways, but probably Instagram, they could DM us. We're pretty um, good at returning yes. calls. And I will make sure to put all of your links in the show notes. So if Thank you me. wanna go and see him, you absolutely can. Thank you so much for being on. And of course you listening at home, if you have any questions you want me to pass on to Dr. Aziza Day or any questions that you want me to kind of look for experts to 
figure things out, you can always reach me at hello at rpdpodcast.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at rpdpodcast. And as always, we will see you next Tuesday. Bye.